All right, I wonder if we should just kick off. Should you think I don't think anybody else has joined just now? So um okay, so I think we'll we'll kick off. And if anybody joins us en route, then the session's been recorded and we will get this out to everybody who is on the, the list. So uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us um, today. Um welcome. Um and uh Please let me just set out this afternoon's seminar. We are going to be um, finishing at 2.30. I know that's valuable time for everybody out there. So we plan to finish at 2.30 and we're not planning on any breaks. Um, as this is a webinar, all um, delegates, video and audio have been disabled. So although uh, you can see us, we can't see you. Um, and this is unlike the normal Zoom sessions that you probably be involved in. So please use the chat function if you want to ask a question or you want to say anything. Uh, it would be, it'd be lovely to hear from you. There will be time for a Q&A at the end. So please use the, again, the, the Q&A uh, function and we will um, come back to you um, at, at the end to answer those questions. Um, if you want to ask a question throughout the session, use the Q&A function as well. Please include which speaker you would like the question to be intended for, and our panel will answer as many of these as we can. And if we don't have time before 2.30, we will um, answer the questions and send them back afterwards. So um, we're going to deliver this se seminar in three different sections. We've got the wonderful Bill Braithwaite, QC, to kick off. Then we've got myself, we've got Emma up there in the corner too, um, following me, and then we'll come back to Q&As uh, Q and, um, and then Bill will wrap up by 2.30. So I hope that's pretty clear to everybody and I'm going to hand over to Bill now to kick us off. Thank you, Heather. How nice to be called the wonderful. Wow. <laughs> um, apologies for the lighting. My, my range extender Wi-Fi is a problem at the moment. Um, I hope you can all hear and see okay. And I hope you can see... Uh, this wonderful scene behind me, you all think in my country residence, uh, actually this is the Calvert Trust Brain Injury Rehabilitation Unit. So we're right on theme here. Uh, it's a topic close to my heart. I've been talking, lecturing, writing about rehabilitation for 25 years. Uh, Heather, I know, similar. And it's interesting, when I first started talking about it, uh, people were genuinely asking the question whether there was any point in rehabilitation. Does it work was a standard question that insurers would ask. And gradually, we've worked our way past that question. And everybody now knows that good rehab is invaluable, both to the patient and to the person funding the lifetime disability. And I thought I'd start off just talking about some of the concrete things about rehab that I think really matter. All my experience, of course, not quite all, but most of it is during litigation. And what we do during litigation, I know this is not the title of my talk and it's not the title of the day because the whole day is about after settlement. But th there is a relevance, I think, to the during litigation part, because in the cases that, that we all do in my chambers, we, we regard treating the patient as being the first priority and managing the litigation very much as a secondary issue. And as a rule of thumb, we manage the litigation round the patient and his or her needs. And I'm going to talk to you a bit about the consultation I've just had this morning, really interesting, where first of all, treating the patient with a good rehab team is the number one topic and then secondly very much as a subsidiary how does all this fit into the court case um so rehab and, and this applies whether it is pre or post settlement can be really very good or very bad or anywhere in between the two and it's quite interesting because Emma is in charge of the talk, and this is very much centered around the notion of post settlement deputy management and good outcomes. It's just as important after the result as it is before 
to realize that you can waste an awful lot of money on very poor rehab with no good goals and targets, no good outcomes, just a very expensive job. And people have been doing that for a long time, um, not always by any manner of means, because most of it is on the good side of good, and some of it's fantastic. Um, of course, having Heather here means that we've got a huge focus on home-based rehab. She's a trustee along with me at the Calvert Trust, so that our rehab unit there is residential. So you're getting both sides of the coin. Um, they both work. They've both got their places. My consultation today is all home-based. Uh, I wonder whether it might be better if it was residential, but, you know, that's not possible. This client wouldn't dream of going into any form of residential. So before or after settlement, I think what's really fundamental is lawyers, and this must include deputies to, I think, a huge degree, and I know Emma very much would agree with this. Deputies have got to know what good rehab looks like, how it works, and what it costs, what it can achieve. Because if you don't know any of that, you're floundering. You know, rehab is costing anything up to 15000 a week. That's a week, not a month or a year. And Although 15,000 is the top end, and Heather and I have got experience of that very figure, we had a really, really interesting problem where the client's wife, who was a nurse, had researched rehab and was quite sure that one specific unit costing 15,000 a week would be suitable for her husband. And so what we did was we shut her up in a room with the defence rehab expert to slug it out, and she came out victorious. And he went off to the Wellington for very expensive rehab. And I think I would say, Heather, that so far as we know, it worked really well, and he exceeded expectations, didn't he? He did, he did indeed, yeah. I mean, when I saw him in hospital, he looked like a man who would be either in coma or vegetative state or a bit above for life. And the acute treatment was really good. We had a discussion about turning all the equipment off, I remember, and I, I did have to say to the wife that I thought it was a bit early. Um, so he was a good example, but then he went from residential he went to home-based, and of course, that brought him on again. Now, he's a good example of somebody who is pre-settlement, or, or was then pre-settlement. But interestingly, at this place that's on the background behind me, right now, we have one of my ex-clients. Uh, nothing to do with me. I didn't advise him to go there. I settled his case for him a couple of years ago. Um, and he has, I say he, his family have found Calvert. And he's there now. And I hope, and this is obviously post-settlement, so his deputy has been sufficiently enlightened to pay, you know, a very significant weekly amount for something that really ought to change his life. Uh, you'll have to excuse, please, the plug for Calvert, but Heather and I are very excited about it. It's new, it started in June, and it's, it, it is interesting in the wider sense because it is centred around the idea of outdoor activity, challenging activity, as being an integral part of rehab and of course, this is what people might want to do post-settlement. Calvert, a separate part of it, has for many years been a respite, a holiday, an activity centre for people with disability. And in that sense, it is enjoyable. And what we're doing in the rehab unit is centering around that, trying to make rehab fun. 
you know, I mean, today, quite interesting. My client, he was a very successful businessman, a real wheeler, dealer, and he is devastated by his injury. And, of course, it's been made more difficult by COVID. Uh, he's had building work done on his house. I mean, it's interesting. He's a car nut, so, you know, we get on well together. But even I had to feel that going out and splashing out 150000 of his own money on two monster new cars was one step too far. And I think he now acknowledges that. Um, but he is desperate for good rehab. It'll be home-based. And we had a good team, Roger Wood, whose background is Brain Injury Rehabilitation Trust, been in it for years. Uh, Ruth Kent, who's a wonderfully good rehab uh, doctor. Maggie Sargent, who's terrific on rehab, as well as a care expert. So really, really informed. We had the case manager, and we spent an hour and a half just talking about what can we do to give this man some fun? He's having a hellish time. And his partner is on the verge of leaving him. What can we do? And it's really interesting because we've got the psychologist talking about medication and really insisting that we get good medication, whereas the treating psychiatrist, when we effectively ordered him to give medication, resigned because he thought it was inappropriate. Our rehab doctor says it's entirely appropriate. So this applies before or after, and it'll apply to some extent even more after settlement, because after settlement, you're in the real world. You're not just you know, doing what the court wants, which some people think is sensible, not that we ever do if we can avoid it, but you're doing, after settlement, you're doing your own thing. You're spending your own money. Uh, this lad who's at Calvert right now, he's spending his own money. I mean, it's true, he got millions, but even so, it's costing a lot of money. And so post-settlement, I think these discussions, I mean, I actually think, and I know this is a very personal view, and I'm not putting it forward as a realistic proposal. I think sometimes the litigation lawyers would be terrifically useful post-settlement to talk about rehab and to get it all sorted if it hasn't been done previously. Because by definition, if we've been in rehab, as I have for nearly 30 years, you, you do get to know what might and might not work. And these discussions, you know, we had quite a blunt discussion. Uh, we, we've delegated to the brother-in-law today to go back and tell his brother-in-law, the patient, uh, we've had a discussion and you are now going to do the following. And that's all there is. No discussion, no argument. That's what you're going to do. And it's quite interesting because post-settlement, a lot of that does become important. I mean, number one, the patient has to enjoy it. That means they've got to participate. That means they've got to buy in. But, you know, post-settlement, the team looks pretty similar to pre-settlement. Now, I could go on. I really could forever about rehabilitation um, there's a chapter in my book about it. I've written, I've actually edited an entire book with Mike Barnes and uh, and another expert, actually Tony Ward Heather, who was in that case. Um, it's been an abiding topic of interest because it's such fun for us as well as the patient. If we can get it really well managed, and this applies hugely to post settlement, to deputies, and all those involved. If we can get a really good package, home-based or uh, uh, residential, we can achieve wonderful results. And for us, I hope, that's fun. That's why we do what we do, because it brings a smile to our faces. Doesn't it, Heather? It does indeed. It does indeed. Bro. Right. Thank Over to you. Over Thank to you. you so much for that insight. It's always a pleasure listening to you talk about rehab, Bill. Um, I'm going to try and share my screen now, um, hopefully. Um, there, is that up and running? I'm hope so. I'm hope so. Um, 
I'll just find the little slide here. Okay. There we go. So I'm going to talk about um, and the importance of post-settlement rehab. And um, I'm, as Bill said, I'm a neuro OT by background and I've been involved with um, the development of reached personal injury services for the last 27 years. Um, and we're just going through a, a rebranding because we were taken over by the Handle Group um, almost a year ago. Uh, but I can't share that with anybody yet because it's all under wraps, but it will get out there very, very shortly. So my, my slides are very plain and I'm going to swiftly go through them because I think that they're quite useful just to focus on some of the points that I'm going to highlight. So I'm going to look at the need for goal-focused rehab post-settlement. And I think the idea of, of this area came from a number of clients that we started to work with, um, where uh, the cases were settled, uh, the clients were just coasting, but actually they weren't moving forward and they were maybe hitting some barriers along the way. And it was important to really look at what rehab looked like post-settlement as opposed to pre-settlement, because it has a bit of a different focus on those two areas, and I'll come on to that shortly. So really to look at the need for goal-focused rehab post-settlement, looking at the benefits, the challenges, and, and throwing in there some solutions. I know Bill's already mentioned the, the wonderful Calvert um, reconnections over in Keswick, um, and we may well come back to, back to that shortly about residential rehab. So I just want to pull together some um, figures or some information from the national guidelines, the ABI national Gu clinical guidelines. So one of the points was after the post-acute phase, continued rehab in the community is really important. And that goes over months or years. So it's a known fact that from a neurological point of view, there's ongoing rehab um, needs and ongoing ability to benefit from rehab. Um, and also we're looking at uh, lifelong contact to meet the changing needs. And that's really important to talk about the changing needs because the needs of a rehabilitation client at various stages in the journey are very different. And, and the next point in the slide is really looking at rehab timetables quite um, different and divorced from the legal timetable. Um, the, from a rehab point of view, it's very dependent on the client. Um, they can be in different rehab stages for different lengths of time. They can achieve certain levels within the different rehab stages. And, and as you know, from a post, um, a post discharge, the client might need more neuropsychology um, and maybe more functional, re uh, more physical rehab, physiotherapy. And then six months down the line, it might be more occupational therapy is the main focus. Um, but then a year down the line, it might be more social work involvement or functional rehab or sports rehab that's more important. So we need to pick up on the right focus of rehab at the right time for the clients. And really the need for rehab persists post-settlement and clients um, have still got goals to achieve. And, and if we relate back to the client that Bill and I were involved with, he was a cyclist and he, he went to the Wellington and had a, a very active period there of, of rehabilitation which is very productive now post settlement now for oh, a couple of years or so bill and he's still receiving four sessions of physio a week no neuropsychology no ot but he's really focused on the physical aspect and this is keeping him going and that's a really key for him so rehab needs change over time and and i think from the the information from headway show that the greatest visible progress obviously as we know is six to twelve months post rehab um, but there's continued improvement over the two-year period. A lot of people suggest that with the natural, um, uh, uh, um, the, the natural uh, th organic and therapeutic uh, development within the first um, two years um, is more active, but then that continuation goes on and on. And we work with clients who are possibly 10 years post-injury and still benefit from a burst of rehab. And there is quite a lot of research out there, which I can share with you which shows progressive decline without the rehab input. And so often it talks about support and care, which can scaffold the client um, post-settlement, post um, but not promote their independence. And, and it's still important to really focus on promoting independence. There's been a lot of research by Jenny Ponsford, which I'm sure some of you out there will know. She's a clinical neuropsychologist from Victoria in, um, in Australia. And she is a neuroscience researcher publishes lots of papers um, and it's, the information from this paper came from the, the BMG in 2005, but she, um, research, she she's very much involved in research in this area um, and, and has published a huge amount. So if anybody has any questions, more than happy to share the information with you. Oops, pressed the wrong one there. Okay. Sorry. 
There we go. Sorry. Um, so typical post-settlement provision and um, the challenges. Um, the, the, the reactive NHS pr uh, provision is um, provided when issues occur, if they can. So it's much more of a reactive um, process than a, than, a, than a creative and preventative intervention. Settlement does not, it does refer to ongoing rehab needs, as, as Bill and Emma are very aware, um, but funds are not ring-fenced for, for rehab, and so although um, perhaps pre-settlement there'll be um, uh, identification of rehab needs going forward, it doesn't always mean that those funds need to be spent on those uh, rehab needs, and Emma will hopefully come back and talk about that a little bit later on. Um, but it's important that these clients are rehabilitated and it's not just the boring rehab that we talk about. It's as Bill mentioned, it's got to be fun because this, this is where the client is from now going forward. Um, and what I'm really keen is really to stress that support and care packages can sometimes result in dependency. And there's quite a lot of research about that as well. So it's important that we get the right rehab at the right time um, at the right level and the right intensity. So that's that's really um, uh, clear and all the research out there shows that it much, it's got to be much more functional based and um, more functional approach. Um, and it's just important, I mean this is a slide that I used the other day when I was trying to persuade um, some insurers about rehab for a client um, and they were saying well do you know we've got a really good support package in there and we've got carers in there and, and do you know what more do we need but the client's kind of not moving forward and I said well there's a massive difference between rehabilitation support and care and this is just a revision for everybody who's who's on this session today because obviously care is doing something for somebody and support is doing something with somebody and rehabilitation is encouraging somebody to do something for themselves and that's where the goal focus comes in and that's where you can measure the outcomes achieved and and that's where my bag is and I, and I know that that's what excites Bill about being involved in the in the rehab world. So just to establish a little bit about what we um, what we see and what we've seen has worked really pretty well over the last few years that we've been involved with cases post settlement. Um, bursts of rehabilitation really are, are really useful, but also sl slow stream rehab can provide a really good solution. So as, a, as, a, as an option for case managers and, and deputies out there, um, bursts of rehab, we, from a personal experience, we've worked with clients where um, they've perhaps post settlement, um, they've got rid of all the, 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 the um, wider MDT and the case manager remains in perhaps. Um, but then, then they hit a dip and they kind of start to slowly decline or they're not progressing on with the goals that they were set pre-settlement. And so uh, coming in, having a burst of rehab, looking at what they're doing and where the barriers are, what could be provided to boost their performance levels in certain areas, um, set that up, make sure that's happening and then come back out again. So bursts of rehab have been really productive for quite a number of clients over the years, but also more of a slow stream rehab now as well. And so perhaps you're in there, but you're working on goals that are not too challenging, but they're helping a client move forward in a nice and um, constructive way. Um, and we can see very, very positive feedbacks from this type of intervention, but it's got to be based on the functionality of it all, because it's all about function. So what the, the, the bullet points I pulled together here really relating to bursts of rehab post-settlement and slow stream approach to post-settlement is that it can limit the impact of, develop, uh, of developing increased needs, which we all want, because you know we don't want the clients to become dependent um, or increasing their dependency at early doors post settlement. Um, this type of intervention can be time limited or low level maintenance. The continuity of the medical team is really important, and that's something that the, the deputy and case manager would ensure anyway. Um, for children, and often um, cases, uh, child cases, as Bill and, and Emma will, will um, confirm, often the cases aren't settled until they're adults, and, and as is the case. But often with, with children, um, different bursts of rehab are coinciding with different developmental stages. Um, and then for adults post-settlement, they may often coincide with maybe life-changing um, situations. For example, if a, a partner leaves, like Bill alluded to his case this morning, that the, 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 um, the partner was on the verge of leaving because it's, it's a tricky, difficult position for clients post-settlement going forward, knowing that this is it for, for years to come. Um, and so it's got it's, got its benefits, um, but also so does residential rehabilitation, so the likes of reconnections um, for a period of intervention to enable the client to focus on their goals and um, look at what they can do moving forward when they do move back home, but also to give that period of respite to the family member as well. 
So just a little bit of a case study before I move on, because I want to make sure that Emma's got plenty of time for her, her presentation too. So a good case study post-settlement was a guy that we've been working with for um, a, about a year or so now. Um, and um, uh, in fact, it's longer than that because it, the, the, the settlement was in December 2019. So this is a 21 year old guy who was in high speed at RTA and he was a cyclist. And he had cerebral contusions, so a diffuse axonal injury, lots and lots of problems going forward. Um, living at home with, um, with family. Um, Pre-morbidly, he was a highly physical, um, had a high physical achievement. He was in the gym, he was out running, he was really sporty. Um, he was a full-time um, self-employed builder, but his family were in the building trade as well. So um, he was part of that, that um, growing dynasty. Um, and he had a super, super wonderful family support. Um, and so pre-settlement, he had an MDT approach, he had the full works, um, and he had support, he had a paid carer in there as well. Um, then it got settlement was December 2019, and post-settlement, um, he didn't want to have the MDT approach. He felt that he'd had his time with all his rehabby people and he wanted to have a break. Um, but the case manager continued on and provided that really important link there for that client. Um, when he didn't want to have any other intervention around. And it wasn't until just after um, the, um, the April, so it was a few months post settlement, that actually he realized that things were starting to slip and he really wanted to focus on some of the goals that he had been achieving and working towards achieving pre-settlement. So timely rehab and bursts of intervention were then required. And the case manager was brilliant and said, OK, well, we'll look at this from a very functional approach. And we were involved then by going back in, having a review and um, looking at the tasks that we wanted to achieve, worked out how we could do that. And then we looked at the progression, the outcomes and really looking at for him to take control of elements of his life um, independently. And that was really important for him because he was relying on other people for the majority of the the areas that he lived, that he focused on in his life. And so by having a burst of rehab, it gave him that another boost of intervention and a boost of motivation, which was brilliant to see. So these sorts of things are, as Bill said, they're all individual. Every client, um, even if they've got the similar types of, of, of brain injury, um, have different needs, they progress at different levels, um, and they have different outcomes. And it's making sure that the intervention that they have, particularly post-settlement, is fun and really, really relevant because I know that Bill has talked about this time and time again. There has to be a fun and an enjoyment element to this. It needs to not all be hard work, otherwise, because we're all we're only here once, aren't we? So, so that gives a little bit of. I know that we don't have much time to go through this. We will forward our slides on, and if anybody's got any questions, they can absolutely come and um, to talk to us. Um, I want to hand over to Emma now. Uh, Emma, if you would like to introduce yourself and, and move on from here, I think we're kind of on, on track, if that's okay. We are indeed. Thank you very much, Heather. That's oh, brilliant. Stop. If you can stop sharing your screen, yeah. I will bring my slides up on my screen. Just bear with me. Ooh. There we go. Are we on? Nope, not yet. Hang on one sec. Um, hang on. It's just uh, there, there, there. There we go. I think that's one of the most common phrases now. Bear with me. <laughs> there we go. Um, got it up on screen now? Brilliant, yes. Super duper. So, um, what I'm going to start to do is I'm just going to talk about kind of the steps that we would normally go through post conclusion and then I'm going to have a couple of examples um, as we go through of, of bits and pieces that we look at and what we think about. So, um, starting with the basics as a deputy, which is what I am and what I do, um, is that the, the very first thing that we seek to do is obviously go and see the client post conclusion and we have to look to understand their wants and needs at that point in time because what they've wanted throughout the case um, is what they've mm, been told to want or what they've known is the right thing to say that they want during the case and actually things might you know once they know that their claims concluded and they know what money they're working with they've then got a bit more time to think about what they really want for themselves so it's really really important to understand where the client's priorities will sit um, and you know the key thing for me here to remember is that I am only property and affairs deputy so I'm in charge of the money and that's a very responsible position to be in 
but it isn't my job to make health and welfare decisions for them and to say you've got to have this or you've got to have that um so very common changes that I will see when I go and see a client post conclusion is that they tell me that they want to reduce the support or maybe that they want to change the nature of the support so they've been having you know um what we would term to be kind of care and actually they might want to reduce some of that and say do you know what as a mum with two kids and a husband it would be loads easier for me if we could just get in a cleaner um and I, I want a bit less care but I want some more help around the house uh, you know and and whether that's felt to be the right thing or not within the claim it's actually what enables the client to practically live their best life is got to be the most important thing so sometimes we do stuff like that um a lot of the time particularly where you've got children with cerebral palsy um the family will want to do more care and they will want less paid care and that's pretty inevitable um and if that's what they want to do um unless there's a real reason why that isn't in the best interest of the client, then generally, you know, we try and accommodate those things. Because I think there's a couple of things that I would really stress here. The first is that um, nothing's got to be forever. So, you know, you will go and see a client and I don't want this anymore and I don't want that anymore and da, 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 da. And sometimes you just got to go, OK, that's fine. Let's run with that. You know, and I did that for a client back in 2008 when really they wanted you know no outside help they had a daughter with cerebral palsy she was whatever she was like 10-ish at the time probably um you know um they didn't want any help they just wanted to do everything as a family and we let that run on and then in about 2012 2014 she was maturing she was a little bit older and the time was right to bring in rehab and a case manager and a physiotherapist and occupational therapist and all sorts of things and that has really empowered her to move on so you know I think the thing is that none of these things are set in stone and sometimes you've just got to give the client their head to let them do the things they want to do so that when they do come back and say I think I'm ready now for some support you know that they're mentally ready to buy in and see the support uh, the the benefit that support and rehab can offer them so it's okay to knock it on the head for a little while and I, and I know there's lots of evidence around you know kind of obviously making the most of your time and the best time possible for doing rehab with somebody but quite often that initial two-year period has passed you know long before we're dealing with a post-conclusion situation from a claim so you've got to get the client in the right mental space to want rehab as well um, and the other thing I think is that and I see it a lot, particularly for people who, for whatever reason, haven't had interim payments throughout the course of the claim. So therefore, you know, they've had no money and they've been fighting hard and they've been struggling on. And then all of a sudden the claim settles. and There's a lot of money there. And their mindset is great. We've got money now. Everything's going to be different. You know, everything's going to be all right because we've got money. And then about and I have it you know, very recently with a client of mine where six or 12 months in, the whole thing falls apart because they realize that having money doesn't put them back to being the person that they were before that there's a whole host of needs that haven't been dealt with and that's when you know kind of marriages fall apart and clients begin to have you know kind of um, mental breakdowns or real mental difficulties because they're suddenly having to come to terms with the person that they are and that money hasn't put them back in the position that they were in that you've got to a you've got to do something with the money but that b even when you have done something with the money that you, that you know you're going to have to accept there will be physical limitations um and you can and and so there's a whole coming to terms with it that particularly has to happen um and you've got to wait for all of those things to happen at a time when that when the client is ready and ready to take on board that information um so you know i see it very much that I'm always happy to challenge decisions if a client's telling me I don't want care and I don't want support or I don't want therapy. Really happy to push back on that. But at the end of the day, I'm generally not the health and welfare deputy. So I can't force a client to accept something if they're not ready for it. So you've got to try and support them, empower them, help through, help, help them think through what those decisions are. So what the effects of that might be um, and point out that, you know, with rehab, this, you know, this could all be different. But at the end of the day, know that you can come back to things in the future and be prepared to do that um 
sometimes, you know, I've called the client's bluff, which is what I put down in the slide. So I had one client who was very, I don't want care anymore. I don't want this. I don't want that. She was quite, quite clearly needed, if not 24 hour care, then a lot of care. And I said, well, OK, let's cancel your care then. She went, oh, uh, well. No, I mean, I don't think I want that. So, you know, you've got to pick your moment. I'm not saying you do that with every client, but but you um, but you can kind of say, well, you know, OK, but, you know, we're ready to implement your decisions. And um, and then they perhaps realise that, you know, they're just testing sometimes control and boundaries. And, and what will you let me do? You know, so sometimes it's great for them to know that you'll be behind them. If that's really what they want to do, then you will be behind them. And quite often that really makes, once they know they've got that control, that makes them think very carefully about how they use that. Um, so what we then do is we look at setting budgets and budgets are in two parts. They're in needs and they're in wants. The most important thing is that you get the needs met. So you budget for all your needs first once you know what money you've got and you see what's left over for the things that they want. And if you can't achieve the wants with the budget you've got left over, then you have to go back to look at the needs and were all the needs things that are really needed or are there any compromises that you can make there. But something that, uh, that I think is really key when we talk about rehab is this concept and this mindset. I talk to my clients a lot about investing in themselves, that they get very worried, you know, when we set rehab budgets and therapy budgets immediately post conclusion. This is quite often not a budget which is sustainable for the long term. We can't afford to spend money at this level and at this rate for the rest of your lifetime. And that makes them very worried about doing that. So I talk to a lot. I talk to clients a lot about investing in yourself. And if we put this investment into you now, it will reap rewards for you for the future so that actually you won't need as much in the future, which means that's why it's wise to make that investment in you now, because actually it will reduce your overall spending requirement for the future. And they and they get that. And it isn't always let's do that straight away post conclusion. You know, I have a client whose claim concluded about six years ago probably um and she's been rocking along very nicely and then a couple of years ago she went through a really difficult time got herself involved in drugs and alcohol abuse and that kind of thing and you know we had been managing quite nicely on the um the periodical payment that we had and so on and then all of a sudden we were having to go right we need to make an investment into you now in rehab and we had some case management and some support and various different types of therapy but that will get you back on the right path you know, she wanted to conquer her addictions, which is really important. She's got to be in the mindset to want to do it. Um, but if we make that investment in you now, you'll be in a much better financial position going forward. So, so that concept of investing in the client to me is a very important one. Um, also, working as a team, we have lots of clients who don't want to talk to the case manager. I'm not saying we tell all the therapists about the money and certainly not all the carers about the money, but that want to keep the case manager very separate from the money situation. The problem with that is that if, if your case manager doesn't know where you are financially, they've got no idea where they can't join in your goals because they've got no idea where you're trying to get to. And particularly where budgets are more limited, that's really difficult if they're not sharing in that information. So, particularly where we're quite constrained by budgets, I like to be, with the client's consent, very open about money. And I really encourage the client to allow me to do that so that I can say to the case manager, this is where I need you to get to money-wise. How best can we get there? Because if we spend more than that, then actually we're jeopardizing the long-term viability of the, of the compensation claim for the client. So we take a team approach, we bring the case manager in that we really, you know, kind of help them to participate in that. That also means that I've got a really big stick to beat the case manager with when they're not complying with the budgets, because I can say you knew where we needed to get to. You've got to help me get there. Um, and the other thing we do is we bring in a financial advisor and we do some cash flow planning. And that's a lovely way for clients who are able to be more cognizant of their financial position. And I've just put a real sample up on screen there as to what it looks like. It's a lovely visual graph representation to a client that I can sit down there with this client here and I can say, right, at age 79 for you, which is what it says along the bottom, it's not helpful that I'm sitting here pointing out where the bottom of the screen is. I'm sorry to do that. But at age 79, you've got about two million pounds left if we assume that your money is going to grow at three and a half percent a year. If we want to spend all of your money at age 79, we can spend another £30,000 a year. That's never a goal, but you know, cash flow planning can be used in all sorts of ways so that you can know what's the most that I can spend 
to run out of money at the end of lifetime? Is this viable? I've also used cash flow planning at times to um, where clients want to know how much they can afford to spend on a house. We, I think it's probably called reverse cash flow planning, really. So what we say is, right, these are all of our needs for life, you know, support, therapies, blah, 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 all the annual spend. If we want to be able to spend this a year, what do we need to have invested? Right, now we know what we've got to invest. That means that from the lump sum, we now know what we've got left to buy a house with. And then, so that tells us then what our accommodation budget can be. So you can use it in all sorts of ways. But the good thing is that for clients to be able to give them a graph and show them their money running out, particularly if actually what they want to do does mean that their money runs out before their life expectancy, to see it in black and white on paper in front of them is a very helpful thing to do because they go, actually, I don't really want to run out of money at 65 because I'm planning on living for 20 years after that. Um, so I've got a little example here of my client T whose claim is recently settled. She's got four horses. She desperately wants to buy a house with land so that she can stable them at home. That would be really good for her mental health. Her mental health is very interlinked with her horses and how much time she spends with them. She had hardly any accommodation claim and only quite a small loss of earnings. So there wasn't enough spare for the size of property that she wanted to buy. So she's having to compromise on the size of the property, but also she's having to compromise on the level of support that she's um, able to take um, she, um, because she'll have to have a bit less support during the day than might be ideal. Um, and so, so there's compromises to be made all around, but, but particularly using cash flow planning, we can really visually represent that to her and therefore we're trying to empower her to make as many choices as possible within a safe space um, so that she could, you know, there's no point in her saying, well, I'm not going to have any care because we know that isn't going to work. So we've, we've got to try and, you know, kind of encourage her to look down sensible lines. But actually, she's been really good at doing that. But the challenge here is still that, that what potentially will happen is that she will try and reduce care too far in order to buy the house that she wants. We'll buy the house and then she'll find she can't manage with that less care. And then we're stuck with a house that we can't afford anymore with a with a bigger care bill than we wanted. So so there's a really delicate negotiation to happen there. Um, and that will also need to factor in things like, you know, therapy and rehab and so on. And how we bring all of those things into play that we have a burst of spend now, make that investment in her, look to buy a nice house that's manageable. Um, and then hopefully with the investment in her, we can reduce the support that she will require for the longer term. And also not being afraid to say to her, right, if you spend like this and buy this house now, what that means is that when you're 65, you'll have to downsize house. You probably won't have the horses necessarily at that point in time. You might not have four, you might have one, but you might not have four horses. So actually you'll need to make some choices at that point in time. And she she gets that, you know, there's a, there's a risk in there. Okay, if you do this, you'd have to downsize at age 50. If you do this, you'd have to downsize at age 65. And so again, we're enabling her to make as many choices as she's able to make for herself. What we then have to do with all of that budget information, the reason that we have to pull it all together, obviously other than the fact that it, it's, it's the right thing to do for the client, is that we have to make a post-conclusion application to the Court of Protection, which sets out a likely three-year income and expenditure budget, and it's got to be very detailed. So you've got to be able to demonstrate that the finances work. I also think that probably, although it isn't the case at the moment, deputies will eventually be held liable where they can't show that they really sought to make the budgets balance all the way through. I don't think it'll be that long before we are asked to cover off in our annual return to the Office of the Public Guardian that we've done some cash flow planning, that we've thought about budgeting, that we have made sure that the money will last for as long as is necessary. I, I think all that's on its way and it just makes sense to do it now, also because it's the right thing for the clients and it's the responsible thing to do. And then in just a couple of minutes at the end here, it's a bit small on the slide, um, but that's because I've got a lot to say. Um, but what I did was um, I looked earlier on this year, I had a client whose claim ended. And so I created an agenda for a meeting with the client and the family after the claim ended to talk about everything we needed to think about. And I've taken you through that. So these are um, the calculations that we had to look at. And it's a really interesting to see that juggling exercise that we had to go through. So. This, this is the piece of paper that I took with me that we got a, we had a lump, a lump sum in the claim of 1.7 million and we had a PPO of 185,000 for a couple of years falling to 163,000 for life um, after we'd made that initial investment in him. Um, what I said to the family was, look, we're just going to work on a basis of getting 163,000 a year every year when we're doing this budgeting, because 
we're going to need to invest that 20,000 a year surplus in him for the, for the first couple of years. And we had no ability to claim local authority or NHS funding, or if we do, we have to give credit for it in the next year's PPO. So there's no, there's no additional funding that we can get. Now, the care regime and therapy regime at the point that we concluded the claim was £430,000 a year. And all of a sudden we were getting 180 odd thousand pounds a year. So there was a massive change to be made there. Um, if we reduce the rent that we were paying, if we were going to buy a house, then then e even then, you know, what we were paying out for was 406 thousand pounds a year. So then I started off by saying, OK, let's assume that we can spend 700 thousand on a house and that we can invest a million pounds. Then, you know, we should be able to draw down around about 50 thousand pounds a year at most. He's, he's a little bit older, this gentleman, so, you know, I can factor life expectancy in, but that would give us an income of about 213,000. Um, after some benefits and pension funding, that would in total give us 237,000 pounds a year, still giving me a shortfall between what he was used to of 170,000 and, um, uh, and what he was getting at the moment. So how do we bridge that gap? And so for me, it was very important to sit down and have a very honest conversation with the family about that. And actually the litigation sister was brilliant. You know, he came to that meeting so that he could really take the family through because what we didn't want was the fam for the family to say, well, how on earth have we got ourselves in a position where we were used to spending this and now we can only spend this, you know, and, and there were lots of factors in that, which was a, a lot to do with the, the, the litigation at that point. And so, it, it, the litigation sister came along so that we could really talk through all of that very openly and transparently with the family and so they could appreciate exactly where we're up to. So I then listed out all the spending that the client was doing um, and, uh, and therefore what those totals came to it was transparent about our fees and what we need to be able to bring them down to a year because um, they were running at higher than that because we had so much organisation that we were doing um, and where could we make savings. And then we sat down and we talked about that between us. So we then set ourselves a care therapies case management budget. Um, and there is scope for a little bit of investment in him. And, and so what we did was we kind of had like a, a two year budget for, for doing some rehab and investing in his needs. Um, but then we knew we'd have to drive it down after that initial period. The other great thing that we did then was our case manager was brilliant. So she, because we'd been so open and honest with her about what we needed to do, she wrote me five different care proposals um, where we looked at what, what the different opportunities were, you know, keeping the care as it is, um, keeping as it is, but getting rid of therapeutic support workers, increasing direct employment to 50-50 um, between agency and direct employment and reducing therapeutic support workers, increasing direct employment to a 60-40 split between direct employment and agency and removing therapeutic support workers and doing only direct employment. And then there was also some case management costs on top. What it was clear to all of us was that the only thing we could afford to do was directly employ and not have therapeutic support workers. But we could make those decisions because we'd seen all the possibilities and, and we'd seen all what all the financial ramifications were. So everybody could make very clear decisions together because we had lots of information in front of us. We made the only decision that we could about the care package, which was to move to direct employment as quickly as possible. We factored in rehab for a couple of years and then we factored in how we're going to phase that out which bits will fall away first where we need to keep contingencies um, we've looked at you know kind of what all those costs were which can drop off which can we move over to nhs um, you know where will that be suitable um, made decisions regarding housing that's always a tricky conversation you know clients always want to buy a house but for some clients they're better off not this client but for some clients they are better off staying in rented keeping their housing benefit um, and that, that gives them a bigger lump sum to invest, which will produce a bigger income for them. So it's not being afraid to challenge a client on that because they all want to buy a house. That's just, you know, that's a natural, a natural thing to do. And then also we could then go on and talk about investments, how much involvement in that did the family want to have? So that was, um, that was the agenda. And there was a lot of uh, hard work and preparation went into that day, but it was such a successful day. We had a very clear plan at the end. We all knew exactly where we were going and what we had to do. Um, and it means that we've made a plan that's already well underway coming to fruition. We found a house to buy well within 700,000. The key now is that the family actually, we're buying a house for just over 500,000 that I've had to explain that 
it is not a goal to spend the extra £185,000 on doing adaptations to the house, but actually let's try and see what can we put of that back into the pot to give him some more financial flexibility for the future. Um, so it's not a goal to spend 700000 on a house, it's a cap. Um, they are two different things. And there you go. Emma, that was brilliant, absolutely brilliant. There's so much information in there that, um, that is added to, to, to my knowledge, but I'm sure to lots of other people's knowledge out there um, as well. Uh, do we have any um, questions? So I'm um, going to have a look at the, the Q&A. So I've had a few questions sent to me beforehand, so I will ask those, and one of them is to Emma. So one of one of the questions I've got through before was from an investment. Do you, are you are your hands tied in terms of risk or risk point of view? Um, oh, your hands aren't tied. You've got to be sensible. So you know, on a scale of one to ten, if one is putting it on the mattress and ten is investing in Brazilian cyber coins, <laughs> whatever. <they're calling laughs> it, um then you know you should be somewhere between a three and a six, mm -hmm. I would guess. Um, but at the end of the day, risk is governed by the return that you need. So you have to sit those two things together. So if you're sitting there with a client who needs to drive a high level of return from their investment and you've done everything you can to pare it down, um, you know, and, and, and Bill, um, Paddy, our old client, um, was very much in that situation so actually what he needed even though he had a nice big PPO what he needed was um, a big return still we needed to drive a big income from the investments that he had to make we had to be prepared to take more risk and that was just the way it was um, so you've got to temper those two things together if what happens is the client's needs mean that you've got to be level eight out of ten on the risk then you've really got to work out how you can drive that down um, mm -hmm. because probably an eight is never acceptable for anybody who's received a compensation claim. But, you know, if you can be somewhere between a three and a six, that's probably about the right levels to be. Yeah, okay. And um, another couple of questions. Um, one that I'll answer and the next one I'll pass on to, to Bill. One was, can you point out some more research in the area regarding post-settlement um, intervention? We're really looking at um, the, the focus on function, which I can do, and I will forward that on. Um, I'll, I'll go back to Jenny's um, work and go a, a bit wider than that and get some references out there to, to, um, to everybody. And another question was a little bit more about the Calvert Reconnections Bill. So if I hand over to you, Bill, and you can maybe talk a little bit more about the, the Reconnections and then wrap up, would that be OK? Lovely. Yeah, thank you. And thank you, Emma. Excuse me. <clears throat> Listening to Emma reminded me of a client we have, Emma, in the Midlands, where father is hugely obstructive to the whole of the rehab package. And we know perfectly well that when the claim is finished, they'll just get rid of everybody. And it will be so sad because the you know, son is going nowhere um, and he's got the capability. Um, Calvert Reconnection started, in theory, several years ago. Um, because the, the service they provide is actually a form of rehabilitation. This is before the specific brain injury one. Uh, they have been providing these outdoor challenging adventure holidays but for the disabled. But of course, the fact that they're called holidays just conceals that people are having fun doing things that make them a bit better stretching joints, stretching capabilities, stretching their minds. So that was the initial thought process that led to the um, brain injury unit. And the brain injury unit, it's early days, we've only got a few patients in at the moment. So good time for anybody to send one, by the way. Um, we have been held up by COVID, but the exciting bit is the idea that these people really might get up in the morning looking forward to the day, because if, if any of you just Google Calvert, Calvert Lakes, uh, Calvert Rehab, anything like that, the pictures on the website are brilliant. 
I mean, you can see what it's like from behind me, and this is just the dull bit. You know, the exciting bit is when you see people abseiling, fell walking in power chairs, um, going on the lake. I mean, they've got something really interesting. The, the whole of their jetty is all orientated for all forms of disability, and they've got a particular boat which is like a small version of a D-Day landing craft where the whole front of the boat comes down. It hinges and it comes down. And none of you, if, if you were, I could see you and I could ask you, would ever guess what that's for? I'll tell you what it's for. It's when somebody in their wheelchair falls out of the boat so that they can get them back in easily. All right? That's the level of risk. Uh, and they believe that risk is essential. Uh, and their motto, one of them is, it's what you can do. Uh, it's a lovely, lovely place. Um, and it's a good place to wrap up, actually, because, I mean, Heather and I are excited about it. We think it's unique. We think it will be a groundbreaker. Once it gets established, we think people will be fighting to get in there because they'll realize life can be fun, even though you've got a bad brain injury. And fun, I mean, it's not all jokes and so on. It's not all doing nothing. It's all to do with maximization of independence, of pleasure, of family enjoyment. You know, the, the conversation I've had this morning, we really don't expect the partner to stay. And we know that if she goes, it's going to be a disaster. Um, and the idea of challenging outdoor activity, I, I, it's not all outdoor. I mean, they've got a wonderful swimming pool, haven't they, Heather? Just Absolutely. wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the whole floor of the swimming pool lifts hydraulically, you know, for, for people in chairs and so on. They've got a sensory room next door. And then quite separately, the sort of big sports hall with the climbing wall and the basketball and goodness knows what. Um, but of course, it's all, it's all functional, isn't it? And, and that's where we think it's interesting. I mean, you're an OT, and it was interesting today. The single most important person in our package is the OT, you know, subject to the doctors and the case manager. Because the idea, you know, OT is getting somebody doing something for life in a way. You know, what will somebody enjoy doing? And that's part of what the Calvert Trust is, is trying to do and using the, the activity. Because activity, apart from the brain function, which is really important, activity helps to improve brain function. But it helps you to be active. It helps you to be fit. It helps you to function day to day so that the physical side doesn't get in the way you know, my client today, he's got constant pain. He's got a sleep problem. He's got a terrible mood swing problem. Um, and, you know, I was thinking, actually, I didn't say it, but I was thinking to myself, I wonder what he would think of Calvert. Mm. Now, it's true, because he's a car nut, he might not think it's wonderful. He might not want to go abseiling. He might much prefer to go to a car showroom, which, by the by, is what he does as part of the rehab. Um, and they, they've also got a little bit of a thing about uh, he has to research. He's keen on older cars. <coughs> excuse me. And so he has to do a bit of research. You know, if you want to buy such a thing, you know, how much do they cost? How available are they? You know, what, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and although that's not a very good plug for the Calvert Trust, it's a jolly good plug from my point of view, because I think it's wonderful. Uh, I just think I love it. I, I often talk, I mean, lots of lots of our candidates are, oh, look, look, hang on, I'm going to interrupt myself. Two clients going in November, Melanie, well done you. Wow. Um, oh, yes, one was going to go into the army. Well, I mean, absolutely tailor-made. Really interesting because probably it'll be a he for sure. I would just about to say lots of my clients are young men because that's the biggest cohort. Um, 
that's really interesting, actually. Um, you know, somebody who was going to go into the army, straight away you're thinking of the routine, the structures, the status, you know, that would have been involved and that person has now lost. And that's a terrible loss. The loss of status, the loss of dignity, the loss of enjoyment, employment, family, friends. Gosh, how many times have I heard about the friends drifting away? Um and, you know, something like Calvert, and it applies to lots of units, and it certainly applies to home-based, part of the function can be to make new friends, friends who take you as you are, not as you were, and take you as they find you and cope with that okay. And that, again, can be a wonderful thing. I just can't, you know, finishing up, I just can't really overemphasize, I don't think, how in all our different ways... People involved in rehab, you know, talking this morning to those three experts and then talking this afternoon with Emma and Heather, you know, it's really not much more enjoyable when all said and done, is there, actually? You know, the litigation side is a bit of fun on the side, but compared to helping the clients, it's very secondary. Um so I think that's where we would end, isn't it, probably? Um, whether you would say it is the single most enjoyable, most important, most functional aspect of brain injury, litigation and post-settlement management, I don't know. But if it, if it isn't the most, it's certainly one of the most. Um so many, many thanks to everybody for listening. Uh, any questions, we're all delighted, you know, directly, indirectly, however you want to do it. Uh, we're all delighted to, just excuse me, delighted to answer questions uh, or, you know, give advice or whatever you want. So thank you all very much for being with you, Emma. Thank you for arranging it. Lovely topic. Great, uh, you know, great hour. Well, a bit more. Sorry about that. Six minutes overdue. Bad management, Heather. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, Bill. Oh, thank, right. and thank you, everybody. Okay. Thanks a lot, everybody. Bye now. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Take care. Bye bye. Bye. -bye. bye, -bye.